Well, first things first, what's uh like what are some of the most successful PR campaigns you've seen? Like what does it look like if you actually do PR well? Yeah, so um one of the most successful ones and I I'm not going to go and talk about huge brands because people who are listening to this, they don't have a huge brand, right? They're trying to get their brand well known. Uh, but there's a, there's a company out there called Fractal and they, uh, sort of do PR for many different brands. Um, there, uh, was a study that they ran for, uh, mathematics, kind of like statistician firm that, um, they, Essentially, uh, we're trying to figure out. It's a, it's a little company, right? And all they do is they crunch numbers. How can they get PR? It's just a consulting firm. Like, it's so boring. And so what they did is they picked something very specific, which was, hey, we're going to go out and we're going to find, and subways, we're going to find how dirty is a subway car. And so uh, it's pretty funny, actually. They went in and they looked at the cleanliness index of different cities in their subways. And they created a map of all that. And what they did is they pitched the map to all the places that were mentioned on the actual um, sort of um, study. And so all the local press, like... Um, Oregon and, and San Francisco and uh, Arizona and, and all the little press are, they started, they started picking it up. And I thought that was just genius in a way where we're not going after like, and I can tell you stories of like, we have uh, a customer of ours who got on CNN by, by pure, pure luck, you know. Um, we, we, I don't want to talk about those stories because it's like, it's literally like luck of the draw. Like nobody can actually learn anything from luck in PR. Um, but I've seen tons of these, you know, one-offs. But what I'm talking about is this, this version of, you know, local study. They basically baked it out of nothing. They were like, all right, well, we're going to go look at cleanliness of subway cars around different cities. And what they did is they actually sent in people they hired in different cities. So they didn't actually fly themselves in, in any of them. They created a map and then they pitched this map to all the local press. Um, we have a, another customer of ours who does the same thing with spam calls. Like, you know, you guys get telemarketing calls all the time. So they, they have an app that tracked what type of spam calls were going to which states and they published on their website uh, sort of, uh, each area code and how many different spam calls they get. And, um, again, something harder to track, but they use, they crowdsource the data and they use people sort of collected for them. And then they went out to all the local press. What I love about those examples is it's not one of these, like, let's think of this crazy story and do a PR stunt, like, Grasshopper, you know, Grasshopper is a company that allows you to have a voice over IP, so like a virtual voice box. They did a thing where they sent chocolate covered grasshoppers to a bunch of press, to a bunch of journalists. And people, journalists opened this, uh, these up and they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. And they covered them everywhere. Um, I don't like stories like that, right? I don't like stories when somebody's like, oh, I just pitched a local media outlet and I got picked up on local Fox channel and that got picked up on CNN and now I'm a, like a celebrity in PR. Because A, they're one and done and B, there's nothing to really learn too much from that. It's It's hard to replicate those types of things. But what's easier to replicate is these like, local studies or the local pressing because local press is starved for content usually um and we don't think about them too much and so creating like little data uh studies for local press is usually in my mind some of the you know cool cool ways to do so to get press so what's the result let's say you run one of these local campaigns you know, you're doing studies on how dirty the subway is and the local press is like, cool, we need a story like this. We need something to run for our viewers to watch or to read about. Uh, what can you expect to get as a founder who put time into doing a study like that and pitching press? So as you start doing PR, you start to think, all right, what is my ROI out of PR? Why do I actually want to do PR? And my study, in my case, whenever I tell people to, to think about this, I'm like, 
it's customers, it's revenue and customers, how many people will actually get to sign up. And there, in both of the cases, when it's a sort of a dirty subway study, uh, the, the idea there was, hey, we, we want people who read the study and they want data and, and, and numbers crunched about their firms, the, whatever they're doing. So we're gonna target publications that are interested in data and insights that they have readers from the same demographic that would eventually come in and convert. And so you'd throw away some, throw up some numbers, but you, you try and think, all right, the most successful, you know, we're a local shop in Oregon. Let's say we get covered by Oregon live. we get covered by these three other publications. And let's say we get on a local news station and we'll get 500 people to come to our site, 300 people come to our site. Can we convert three of them and how much money will we make from it? And that's how you kind of want to start thinking about it is not so much like, can I get press? It's like, how are they going to convert into paying customers? And so um, with the telemarketing uh, case, the company ended up getting acquired. They ended up getting so many downloads of their app and it's such a, like repetitive task of creating reports on telemarketing calls in different area codes and getting published over and over and over again, that it, it keeps feeding them more and more leads. But yeah, I would try and sum up your effort in the, in that fashion where it's like, all right, I've done this much outreach. I gotten this much press. I've got this much paying clients from that press and kind of separate that out, you know, that effort. So let's talk about, you know, maybe the, the best way to approach this is talking about some of the problems that new indie hackers face, that experienced indie hackers face. I think from where I sit, and I talk to a lot of brand new indie hackers who are just now getting into this, one of the biggest issues that they deal with is that they don't really know what challenges are in front of them. Like they can't accurately identify what they should be worried about. So they spend a lot of time worrying about things that don't matter that much. Like they spend a ton of time trying to figure out what their idea is going to be or how they're going to build a product. And it's not even on their radar that even if you have a good idea and a good product, it's kind of hard to get people to find it because there's just so much competition. You know, if you build it, they will come, like doesn't really work. And I think brand new founders don't understand that. And I think for a little bit more experienced founders, you know, they've built lots of stuff and they've realized that it's actually hard to get customers and users in the door, but that doesn't necessarily mean they know how to do it. And it doesn't necessarily mean they have a good strategy for doing it. And when you're talking about these stories, it's pretty clear that these companies have uh, sort of figured out a lot of this different stuff, right? They've realized that, hey, just because you get a lot of people in the door doesn't mean that they're going to stay. Or just because you get one big press hit doesn't mean that uh, you're going to keep getting press hits. So, you know, from your perspective, what do, you, what do you see as some of the bigger problems that founders have with getting PR? What are some of the things that are unintuitive? And what are some of the things that should just be on, on founders' radar when they're trying to figure out how to grow their company? Yeah. So 99% of people who come to us and uh, try to sign up for Just Reach Out uh, actually don't have a story. That's the main reason why they don't know what to do. So you are building a, a tool, you have a side hustle, you, you built something, you have an ebook, a lot of them have like a course, a blog, and they don't know how to pitch press. Like they can't pitch press and just tell them that they're awesome because Nobody does that. They don't have a study or an insight to do so. They could create it, but they don't know how to start what would be successful. That's the biggest hurdle for people. And I always say, you know, ask, figure out what journalists are asking for and just start answering them. Um, I always keep this screen up and, you know, I, what I'll do is I'll just kind of show you you can see my screen up here, and this has a bunch of questions, right? A bunch of questions from journalists asking about specific <laughs> entrepreneurship uh, kind of like questions, right? I can pull up one of them, but it's essentially like I put in entrepreneur into search and I'm like, what do journalists want to know from like entrepreneurs? Like now, like what do you want to do? And you know, like I'm reading one that says, hey, I'm looking for five things you need to know to succeed in the beauty industry as an entrepreneur. It's like, all right, well, that's very specific. Um, if I'm in that industry, I know a bit about beauty industry. I go ahead and I answer this and I get featured in, you know, BuzzFeed, for example, that's, that's a journalist from BuzzFeed that's looking for this. 
Um, so these um, queries, I, I call them, they come out on Twitter. They come out on newsletters, free newsletters like Harrow. Um, you can go on Twitter and type in hashtag journal request or hashtag PR request, and you'll find all of them. And what you would want to do is you essentially answer them, right? And start recording like all right well it seems to me that new york times is always asking about productivity and entrepreneurs or productivity and remote work maybe there's a trend there so that maybe i should come up with something right around that so using these questions from journalists whether they're expired or current to really um, dial into what um, they want and essentially become their assistant that's where i would do uh, for most people listening to this, I think, because most people don't have that story baked. And that's what you want to do to build relationships with journalists, to understand what they want, that kind of thing. I think a lot of being a founder is, it's kind of just an exercise in psychology and really understanding what other people want. And sort of the default way that people go through life is they think, what do I want? You know, I want this. How do I get this thing? But if you're a founder, you got to flip it around. If you're building a product, you have to think about, what do my customers want? You have to give them what they want, understand their perspective and what they need. If you're trying to get PR, what you're saying is you have to do the same thing with the press. You can't think about the fact that, hey, I just want traffic and press. I want to hit. Let me just send you my product. You have to think about what the journalists want to get their job done. How can I make that easier? And what you're saying is what journalists want is some sort of story. And not only do they want a story, but they need stories so bad they're actually putting out requests in these newsletters and these websites saying, hey, I really need help putting together the story. If you're an expert, um, you know, respond to me and I'll help, you know, you can help me write the story and maybe I'll include a link to your product. Is that the only way to come up with the story? Do you need to go and read what journalists are requesting? Or is this something that you can kind of just magic up by yourself, you know, in a dark room by yourself, you know, working on your product? What kind of story you want to tell? So I would default to what they're asking first because most people and I deal with people who don't have experience in PR. And so because they don't have experience in PR, whatever they dream up in the room there along with their team members or their co-founders is usually not a good fit for a journalist. They need a little bit more education and priming to start looking at these questions, answering them and seeing a little bit of a trend so they can use the questions to base their story from. So the real life example of this is, you know, we had a customer that came in and they did, uh, they, they find fraud in uh, construction equipment loans, very boring topic, right? But it's a consulting company that can analyze and tell you if when you rent construction equipment, like for builders and, and such contractors, and when they rent the equipment, if there's been fraud involved, right? Very boring. And so they thought that between the three guys there that, hey, they're going to just have the most kick-ass blog about construction equipment and finding fraud in it. Turns out like most people who are contractors are not looking for blog articles about this stuff. And what really works is sort of, um, there are three sort of magazines where um, a lot of them uh, sort of kind of gravitate to where publishing in these magazines is probably the best way. And there's a few podcasts. And so what they started doing is not building up their own blog or pitching sort of fraud stories, but actually just taking examples of previous sort of uh, fraud uh, in any industry, not just construction, so you're going after financial and so forth, uh, computer equipment, and debunking these and publishing them on other guest publications. And they've been doing this for like two years now. They've been one of our best customers in terms of ROI, right, for them. But they did that by looking, they typed in fraud into our search and they found, oh, like a lot of like financial publications are actually interested in fraud that's not financial fraud in terms of like bank fraud, but actual you know, physical goods fraud that people are doing the renting equipment. And so they're like, oh, we have that parallel. Maybe we should start responding to these questions, uh, queries from journalists started doing so got pulled in and then these journalists are like listen you, you seem to know a lot about this fraud stuff you only know construction stuff but 
this actually applies to all these other verticals. Can you work with us? And so the, so the, in terms of ROI and just press, they ended up changing their direction a lot. So I would start there. I would really start there. Don't try to make up your own stories. Um, you can, but use that to inform yourself, you know? Yeah. It sounds like even if you want to make up your own stories, it's much better to start by doing what you're saying and reading all these journalist requests, because that gives you so much practice uh, and insight as to what journalists actually want. And then maybe later, if you want to come up with your own story, now you actually kind of know what journalists want. You've had experience, you've read all this stuff, and you're not just sort of operating from a place of no knowledge and no experience. Yes, exactly. You you want to be informed. You want to read these and say, oh, uh, Shafir from you know New York Times wants to know uh, what's your best way to stay productive uh, during you, you know pandemic. Uh, she needs this by eight a.m. in the next three days. I have one way. Maybe I can you know uh, refer, you know let her know. Maybe she doesn't use my tip, but at least I know that she's asking about it and she's from New York Times. Great for me to know that. Maybe I can. I uh, use that in the future pitch. Maybe I can continue monitoring. Maybe more people are asking about that, you know. So I like talking to you about PR because one of the things that you always do is you kind of highlight the stories of people who have really boring businesses. I'm like, hey, Dimitri, how do you get PR? And you're like, well, look, this construction company is just so boring, but they are able to get PR, you know. And this other guy is running this company. Which it's just like no one wants to read about it. But he was able to get PR. Uh, what about if you have like an interesting company? I guess, how much time should you spend thinking about how to make your company interesting? So an example that comes to mind is I talked to this a friend of mine, uh, Greg Eisenberg, who has this website, you probably need a haircut.com. And he was able to just really crush it with the press a few months ago because COVID-19 is this trending topic, obviously. Everybody cares about it. Lots of people are complaining about the fact that they can't get their haircut because all the barbershops were closed. And he like really just sat down for a day or two and just thought about, you know, what's a really good name for this? How do I tie this into current events and make it something that people are going to care about? And I think he had like a really interesting business from the get-go. Do you think it's important to, to try to make your business interesting? Or do you think it doesn't really matter what you do, even if you're boring, you can get press and it, it, you shouldn't think about it that way? Well, um, plenty of people have capitalized on what happened with COVID. First of all, we had, um, we have a company that bought flatten the curve, like that whole URL put up some random, not some random, but some regular data on there. Like, you know, how to do this and that, and their traffic just skyrocketed. They got into ABC news and all these crazy publications and uh, somebody acquired the whole thing really fast and it was right this data shop is running it um so there's plenty of people who see an opportunity they built something to capitalize on it they think it's going to work really well in terms of pr and and they and it does you know and uh, i'm all for testing stuff out so before you even build something like that i would send pitches out and see if people are going to respond to it if mm. your friend, you know, the haircut thing, you know, before even sitting down for an, a day, I would start sending out pitches saying, hey, are, are journalists uh, going to be interested in, in the pitch around it? And if I get some data back saying, hey, yeah, I want to see more about this. What is this? And I want to see more about this. And we're like, all right, well, maybe I should go build it. That kind of thing. I think about it that, uh, that way because I think of like studies and insights and, and and even blog posts of uh, case studies or whatever before investing time into something like that you want to know if people would be interested in, in in it um but i um i would do what you're most passionate about i wouldn't um try and equate it with like if it's going to be successful in the pr it's kind of like where are your expertise and what are you most passionate about and what do you get pleasure out of day after day after day? If you were not going to make any money from it, right, would you still do it today? And that's how I would judge about like what you should put, sink your time into. Um, I'd say boring business or not, you, you have a possibility of getting press. It's just figuring out how something like your friend might be a little easier, right? It's, it's, it's very topical, uh, and, you know, I don't know if he tested or not before he even launched the site, but a couple of days worth of work is also fine, you know. So, um, yeah, so I, I would go with what's passionate. Don't worry about it too much about how the press is going to react to it. But if you are able to make your passion a very topical kind of term, then 
Great. Have, have a good pitch. <laughs> Let's talk about that that idea of testing, because this is so important if you're an indie hacker. You don't have a ton of money. You don't have a ton of time. You don't want to spend six months building something that no one's going to care about. And I think traditionally, the way that most indie hackers test stuff is they put up a landing page. And you know it's kind of a fake website before they build the product, and they're like, "Hey, let's see how many people sign up for this. Let's see how many emails I can collect." And then you know they post it on Product Hunt or they tweet it out or something. And then if it doesn't get a good reception, they're like, "Okay, I'm not going to build this." But I haven't heard anyone do what you're suggesting, which is, you know, pitch the press, send out emails to your journalists, and ask them, you know, I guess tell them about what you're doing and ask if, if they're interested in hearing more. What does that look like? You know, how would what would you actually say? How would you find the right journalist to pitch? And if you don't have anything actually built. You know, yeah, how do you do, do this in an honest way? I'm going to do the old school turnaround. Uh, okay. So this is a pitch uh, that's... Here, I'm going to look and change this up a little bit so you guys can see. But this is a pitch from Brian Dean, which a lot of people have seen before, um, at least his, his blog. But as you can see, it says, Hey, I just read your story on health benefits of keto diet. I've got a good one for you. A new survey of 2,000 keto followers that found 87% of keto dieters report that they cheat on the diet. Happy to provide more context and findings. And so that's actually pretty interesting because like I would, so this is essentially a skeleton for a pitch I would do without any data. This is me just guessing something like that. And if you wanted to, after you have the data, you can add a little uh, thanks, Brian. P.S. If you want to quickly scan some of the key findings, here's the link. This is if you actually have the data. But if you don't, you can take a stab and think, oh, 2,000 keto followers that found 87% keto followers, you know, cheat on the diet. Now I'm just going to take a wild stab at it. And hey, if, uh, if they question it, I'm going to say, hey, I'm still, I'm still gathering the data, right? So the idea here being is, hey, I want to test whether this is going to be a cool article down the line. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to take a wild stab and say, hey, I'm going to do a study that's going to say the majority of them, like 87%, just cheat on their diet. And we'll see what people bite. And if people bite, I'll be like, oh, let me compile the data and then I'll let you know. And then if that data is a little bit different, then okay, it's a little different. And if you don't want to cover it, fine. But at least I have validated that I got five responses saying, I want to see data on this. So I'm like, all right, well, if you want to see data on this, I'm going to run this little study. I'm going to create a little poll and I'm going to find people that are keto and promote it, you know? Um, so I'm a huge fan of doing that. Like just before invest any, any time into that haircut thing or this keto study, um, just send it out to journalists. Like the worst thing that can happen, nobody will respond to you and you probably won't do it. Uh, but that won't cost you a day or two. It will cost you 10 emails, five emails to journalists just to see, you know. But if somebody responds, then it's like, oh, it, it's an exciting like time. When you get a response from a journalist, it's like, Awesome. It's a good feeling, whether it's a negative or a positive, you're like, somebody read my thing. And mm -hmm. so, so anyway, so I would do something like that. Let's dive into that a little bit more. Uh, earlier, we were talking about how you need a story for journalists. And there's all these websites and newsletters and there's tools, justreachout.io. You can easily sort of find and search all the things that journalists are requesting uh, help with for their stories. If you're trying to send out like a little minimum viable product like this, a little survey you put together or some information to see if journalists bite and test your idea, should you go the same route of like searching for things that journalists are asking for? Um, or do you just like, you know, some other find some other way to compile a list of journalists to email with this with this information? So like two ways. So I would literally I'll put keto into the press opportunity search and I'll put keto into the journalist search. The press opportunity search tells me what they asked about this term, the journalist search tells me what they've written about this term. So I need to know one of two things. A, did they ask about keto in the last six months? B, did they ask, did they write about keto in the last six months? So if one of those is true, then the, probably the right person to chat with. If they're asking about keto, then they're interested in it. If they've written about keto, Chances are they might be interested in it again, depending upon what they've written about keto. If they've written about keto in the last three articles or four articles, then they're really interested in it. Then my chances of getting a response is even higher. Mm. 
So I want to be like targeted basically, like, right. I want to target the right people uh, with my message. I don't want to spam a list. That's the number one mistake that most people do is people think quantity. Even though I tell people quality and I teach people quality in my courses and in my software, people are still thinking quantity. How many can I email that can respond to this? Loosely speaking, all these people are in, in diet world, you know, in fitness, they should be interested in keto. Not the case. If they didn't cover keto in the last four or five articles, if they didn't ask about it in the last six months, I don't care like if they covered it a year ago or they did one article seven months ago, or even if they did one article four months ago, they're not the go-to person on keto. They're not really, really interested in it. And so you want those data points to really target this way. You know, most of our customers, they get 70% open rate and they get about 30 to 40% response rate on all their email pitches. They send quality over quantity. So they'll send, you know, 10 emails, 20 emails a week, but most of those will get opens and close to half will get responses this way, you know. And what are some tips for writing good emails? Besides targeting the right journalist, is there a certain length of email you should be targeting? Is there a certain thing you should open with? Uh, should you be following up if people don't respond? Yeah, so our software kind of doesn't let you send emails um, if they are not kosher based on our standards. Uh, but we have this um, check which pops up all the time. Um, I'm not going to turn around the laptop, but I'll just read it off to you. So there's all these things that it checks for you. And then if something is wrong, it's like, well, got to fix the email. So uh, the subject line should be between 45 to 65 characters long. So we don't want to go too, too long. And the subject line really want, needs to be more of an actual headline of the article you want them to write. So in a good example is 75% of toilet owners fix their own toilets. Uh, something that's like pops and it's like, what? Like I, I need to know. So you're, you're essentially kind of like writing, uh, that's the headline for them. Um, yeah. and, um, it needs to have some kind of like informational gap uh, for them to kind of open the email. So an example is like, which states have the most handy homeowners? Uh, so it makes sense for them to kind of open that up. So it's like study, which states, blah, blah, blah. Or, um, and these are all study driven. So, I mean, you don't have to only do studies, but I'm just saying like your number one focus is that subject line. And we harp on it in the tool and in the, in the, in, in the, the actual course subject line is your key to them opening that email. So when it arrives in that inbox, that's the de by design, you got to lure them in by that one subject line and you only have up to 65 characters. Usually uh, we recommend to, to lure them in. So that's why it's the most important part. And then the next part is really the pitch itself. It's more of a teaser around 200 words, maximum uh, short and sweet, no huge bios about what you do. Um, the very first part of the pitch usually addresses something they wrote or something they asked about. The second part is really what you have to say about what you're doing that's relevant to what they wrote or what they asked about. And really to ask, do you want to hear more? That's the very first, you got to gauge them, right? Read it out loud to yourself before sending it twice, then send it out. Do not send anything to journalists that you haven't read outside out loud to yourself. Um, but yeah, those are like some, some tips I can send them to you after too. So people have them in the like little bullet, um, bulleted list. We have a tool on our site that's free that literally you start typing your pitch and it'll start correcting you and it'll start Ooh. like changing up all these suggestions for you. <laughs> yeah. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And I like the call to action at the end where it's kind of like, do you want to hear more? Or are you interested in this? Where you're not just immediately asking you know, will you write an article about this? You're kind of going one step at a time and you're like, well, you know, let's start a relationship. And if they are interested, then we'll, you know, get deeper into this relationship and I'll have bigger asks and the follow-up emails, but not immediately right off the bat. Right. No, totally. That's what you want 
it's like talking to a person, right? You never walk up to them and just try and like ask them to cover you. It sounds off if you're at a mixer or social mixer or something. So you'd never want to do it over email. For some reason, people think they want to. But <laughs> There's something about the internet where, uh, you know, we all kind of know how to deal with people in real life. Well, maybe not all of us, but most people do. But yeah. the second, like you don't see a person in front of you and you're sending an email or you're tweeting at someone, uh, suddenly people just do all sorts of stuff they would never do in real life. Um, yeah, they spam weird. communities, they send sp impersonal spam emails with these huge asks, ask people for like way too much of their time or their attention, so. Crazy, I don't know why people do that. It's hard, like, I guess, for people to visualize themselves standing in front of that person. I always yeah. do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it's smart to, to sort of have a check in your brain to remember, like, this is a real person. I got to treat them like a real person. They're not just an email address. Um, yeah. So we were talking earlier about kind of these big, lucky PR hits that people get. And just in my experience talking to founders, that's kind of the thing that everyone's chasing. Everybody wants to be at the top of Product Hunt. Everybody wants to be written about by Forbes. Uh, everybody wants to get on like a talk show or something where they're just going to get tons of traffic all at once. And, you know, I, I don't think it really works out that well. It's hard to do. And I think even if it does happen, often the results aren't what you wanted. So a, a good post on Indie Hackers that someone posted yesterday uh, was actually Rob Fitz, the author of The Mom Test. He posted about how in his first startup, he basically had this huge PR win where he got onto the Rachel Ray Show, which is like the second biggest talk show in America at the time. It was on primetime TV. He got like you know, the hosts were gushing about his product in front of 7 million viewers and their traffic to their website was crazy. And then like, of course, you know what happens after that, you know, a week later, the traffic is back to what it was. It was just a flash in the pan. It didn't matter at all that he got that huge push. Uh, how do you, how do you avoid that as a founder? You know, if you're doing all this good stuff, if you're getting PR and it's working, how do you avoid the problem where all your traffic's probably just going to go away if you haven't, you know, done the right things to make sure that doesn't happen? So A, I always caution people to think that way. Like people come and are like, I want tons of traffic so I can get tons of sales. And I think, well, what can you do consistently to get sales over and over and over again and not just get tons of sales at once? And the second thing is going after big media, going after, um, I, uh, uh, you know, you want to be in the spotlight, right? Um, and the, you don't want to be in the spotlight. That That's the whole mistake that people usually make is you don't, like, if you are on the homepage of TechCrunch or New York Times or something like the Forbes, you get tons of people flooding your site. But let's think, like, realistically, like, how many people that are your ideal customer actually come to your site? It's probably a small percentage, right? And um, the rest of the people that come and they, they check out your site and they give you questions and they, they're clicking all over the place, it's just noise. It's noise you don't want. They pollute your whole funnel, your metrics or whatever. And so to go after that tiny percentage of a huge audience, um, there's better ways to do so with PR and content uh, and not do this huge splash on let's be on CNN, right? Because everybody and their mother focuses CNN. So if you're on CNN, only a sliver of those people would be interested in you. And so, um, and it's so short lived, right? So I avoid those. And that's why when you ask me, like, can you uh, name some great PR stunts, PR hits? It's like, I'm not going to go into like these crazy stories of, of people getting on, 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 on these talk shows because it's not worthwhile for anybody to listen to, to aspire to, to even think that way, right? What you want to do is you want to go after the places where your audience are hanging out and do it steadily one at a time and get those small uh, bumps, right? And you want to use PR to help you rank on Google organically. And so as an example of something like this, say you're like a furniture design company, again, a very boring niche where you can't really create anything um sexy you might like some crazy desk or something but you know it's very hard to innovate uh in, in that space we have a couple customers in that space so you're not going to go and try and pitch like cnn for like oh we're helping all these offices with uh free furniture right you're going to look at where my audience hang out well, my audience are googling around like cheap stand-up desk for my home office. They're Googling around like how to construct my own cheap 
a DIY desk, right? And the idea being is that you eventually want to rank for these keywords because even though that uh, alternative to sitting desk or something like that, you want to rank for these keywords because that's where your audience are hanging out. It might be that there's only three people uh, a, a month that come in from a page like that that you put up, but it's three people that are very interested in your product and it would buy. It warrants more daily, weekly compounding effect uh, with that traffic constant mm. um, than you getting on TechCrunch or something like that or CNN. Uh, now, in order to rank for these keywords, you do need to contribute and you need to get press mentions here in different publications. But the publications you go after are going to be in the furniture design space, maybe in the architectural digest. Maybe you're going to go after specific publications where it's your industry and maybe even lower, smaller blogs in the design industry, in the interior design industry, where you're going to go contribute to these publications. You're going to be mentioning some of these pages you want to rank on Google for. Um, and then eventually you're going to start ranking on Google. And that's how I've built just reach out is, um, I've never run ads and we do a little bit of partnerships, but we don't do too much of it. It's literally ranking for the term you Google media pitch. I rank number one, you Google PR outreach. I rank number one. They're not huge terms. There's maybe, I don't know, like, um, uh, a thousand people a month that would search for one of them. Uh, but you know, we get people who convert over to an actual customer because they're looking for the best media pitch to use or the best PR outreach tactic. They're very specific things. And so that when I do podcast interviews or I go on uh, and, and write for other publications, I'll always reference these resources that I've written um, because I get links to them. They start ranking and then Month over month, they pull in traffic from Google, and that's how I built the business. Mm. Uh, it's not the actual PR hit. That PR hit will never continuously give you more and more and more and more leads. It's um, it's like, how does that PR hit rank or, or link to your ranking pages, and how does it help you rank over time from Google? This is, this is so smart, and there's so much good stuff here. I think kind of the, the theme is you're always thinking one step ahead. You're not just like, hey, I really want to get a lot of traffic from this, you know, this press hit, and then you have no idea what comes next. You're always asking what comes next. And if you realize that search engine optimization, ranking high in Google, is a good source of consistent traffic, you know, if you're the number one Google result for some popular search term that corresponds with what you do, people are going to search that daily, weekly, monthly, and you're going to get a lot of traffic indefinitely. And PR isn't like the end goal. PR is just one step you use to help you rank that page highly. I think that's super smart and not a lot of founders think that way, especially if they're, if they're early on. And one thing that is to realize is that it doesn't have to be that big of a popularity for the term. So it could be 70 searches a month, uh, it could be 100 searches a month. It doesn't need to be thousands, right? When you're starting out, it's very hard to go after these terms that are very popular. People listening to this and they'll be like, oh, I feel the best email marketing software. I want to rank for that. No, don't start out there. Start out with like, uh, best alternatives for active campaign or something like that, where the person looking for that is very specific. They are not satisfied with active campaign and you have something better or something very specific business email template for cold email outreach leads or something like that, where it's like, it's a, we call it in SEO, we call it SC long tail, you know? Yeah. So I think that's the other smart thing, which is that you're not trying to go big right from the beginning. You realize that it's better to take it one step at a time, get the easy wins going, and then eventually build your way up to something big, or maybe you never do. And I think what's cool about that is not only is it easier and it's kind of good for your morale as a founder, it sucks if you're always trying to go for like the biggest possible win and you just never get there, you're probably just going to quit. But if you have these easy, small wins where you can like get one every week or two, then you feel pretty good about yourself. But also, I think if you have a brand new app or website you're building and you're not sure if people like it and you're not sure if people you know, come in mass, if they're even going to stick around, you want to get like small numbers of people into your app you know, a week or two at a time so you can kind of test things and fix things and talk to your customers. And I think this is where a lot of people struggle. They're kind of like you know, zero or one. You know, I either get to the top of TechCrunch or the top of Product Hunt or I don't. And this PR strategy seems like a good way to just like get kind of some small 
wins in the door. You know, maybe you get featured on like a small blog or a small uh, local news station or something, and you get a few hundred people to your app, and that's a good way to test. Do you think that's something that you can do do you consistently like get these kind of small PR wins, or is it more uh, you get like one big PR win and that feeds into some page you have on Google? I'm much more of a small wins type of a person, right? And so uh, we have thousands of people who have used our platform and are using it. And most of them, it's a psychological game. When they sign up, they want homepage of New York Times. We tell them no. They start going for it anyway. And um, they fall down. You fall down pretty quick because most people won't get there, right? And as you fall down... You get so disappointed with yourself that you just stop all activity to altogether because it's just you think you're a failure because these journalists don't see you as a success or you try and go volume and you're trying to hit up and spam everybody out there because you know what you got is the best thing. What I usually say is getting two, three small wins, then getting two, three more, and then two, three more, and then going after medium tier, and then doing three and three and three a medium tier, and then trying to get to the higher tier is where most people succeed, right? One step at a time to try and build up. Respond and do a few podcast interviews. That makes you feel good. You get get some confidence. You put that out on your site as some validation that, hey, I've been somewhere. I've gotten two or three interviews. Then maybe you go and you do a few more and a few more. And then eventually you have maybe 16 of them there, you know, and then you're like, oh, well, I've done 16 really tiny, small podcast interviews. Maybe I should go after a middle tier podcast. Um, and so you, you feel good by doing this and you have more confidence in yourself and it just moves you in the right direction. Uh, because you just get burnt quick by these huge uh, kind of like uh, initiatives that don't uh, give you results right away. And uh, people are very much last minute thinkers. So it's like, if you and I had the best day of our lives today, and then something really crappy happens towards the end of the day, you're going to think of that day as just the worst. <laughs> like you're going to, yeah, yeah. you're going to go. And, it's usually not the case. Like you just were having a really good day. Maybe you had a really bad fight with somebody, right? But overall, the day was pretty good. And if you went back to all the good things and the bad things, you brought, but you'd only harp on that last bad thing that happened. And so <laughs> same with PR. It's kind of like uh, if you're going to go and you're going to go after huge fish, throw in some like smaller ones in there just so you have some successes. So it's like, I didn't get TechCrunch, but you know, I got on these three podcasts and it was awesome. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, I think you want practice too. You know, if you're going to be on stage uh, for something, let's say, you, you know, you've learned how to sing and you're going to be on a stage for singing. Do you really want your first time on the stage to be in front of a national audience of millions of people? Like probably not. You probably want some practice on smaller stages. So when you get to the big time, you're actually ready. Like, do you really oh, want yeah. your product in front of like everybody who visits the New York Times? Probably not. Probably there's a lot of bugs and issues and features you haven't thought about. And if you can get some practice on smaller audiences first, then by the time you hit the prime time, it's not just going to be a waste or an embarrassment. Like, it's actually going to work and people are going to like what you've built. Right, 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 right. No, totally. I, I've screwed that up so many times myself. Like, we all have. Just getting, just getting on like stuff that I wasn't even supposed to really be on and getting tons of promotion and <laughs> not. It's like I see these stories stuff. all the time. Like even for myself, like some of the first startups I launched, like we would get press and it's like we didn't even have like an email capture form on our homepage or we hadn't set up Google Analytics. Just like basic stuff that we would have figured out if we hadn't like gone for the goal right off the bat. Uh, I remember, which is, in hindsight, so dumb. There's a guy named James Sinka, and he runs the Sleep Labs uh, startup, and he was on the New York Times, and he got a ton and ton. It was like a focus on him, on, uh, and he does something called uh, dopamine fasting, where like mm. you basically don't engage with anybody, and you don't look at devices, and your dopamine levels go way down, because your dopamine gets really high whenever you're looking at screens. And so he said something to a, a founder saying, hey, I can't talk to you right now at a big event, 
um, I'm dopamine fasting. And that founder tweeted it, and some New York Times reporter picked it up and was like, I want to fly across country to, to interview. And he's like, what? That's crazy. I just said that to somebody. And so this New York Times writer did a, a, a whole um, day with them. They dopamine fast together. And the this, this story was going to come out. And he called me right before the story was coming out. He's like, Dude, like, it's going to come out in, like, 24 hours. Like, what should I do? I Like, I have a site that's got, like, my contact info. What would I do? I'm like, well, first, you want to, like, capture people's emails. Second, you want to mention people that you, you want to have friends uh, with. You want to get friends. Like, Nur Ayal, maybe Tim Ferriss, maybe some other people in your space, mm. right? You want to mention them in the interview so that... When the interview is live, you can ping him and be like, hey, Tim, I just mentioned you in this New York Times article interview, uh, and so forth. And so, uh, you know, you want to make sure you have a, a recapture method. So when people are visiting your site and they leave, you can run ads at them, right? Retarget them, right? So you want to put those pixels up. He's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So you start putting some of that stuff up there. Those are just some of the basics kind of like after the fact before the the actual uh sort of story comes out but even before that he hired some some people to kind of prep him on how to spend that day with the, with the journalist but he's never had press before so um it was a huge kind of like learning curve and had he not gotten a lot of this help probably missed out most of that traffic just you know like that email capture thing or just even pixeling everybody who's come to your site and making sure you can retarget them but people just miss that all the time super smart <laughs> yeah it just comes back to this theme again of like think one step ahead if something good happens to you you got to be preparing in advance or how you're going to take that energy and use it to get some other really great thing in this case becoming friends with these influencers or people you look up to or you know building an email list or building a list of people you, re you can retarget with ads etc what are some of the other other things that you can do if you're going to get a lot of press um that you can really take advantage of well i think like when when you know that a story is coming out that's probably one of the easiest most privileged kind of positions you can be um at and so a lot of times what i would do to prepare for it is to really analyze how many of that press is noise versus signal right Mm -hmm. majority of it is just going to be noise. It's people just reacting. They're kind of interested, kind of not. And so I'm going to think, how can I qualify people on the email form uh, intake on my site? So I'm definitely going to have some, some kind of like book a demo, try out this thing, right? But on there, I'm going to ask maybe three, four or five questions. And over the years, I've gotten very specific on kind of the kind of customer I like to have. I just reach out. I want customers who, you know, have a content marketer on their team. I want customers who have gotten some press or at least have been on one podcast episode or something like that. Those are all indicators that they're serious about content. They know what they're doing that they have a live product out there. That's another qualifier. So I, I literally on my book demo request, I ask them those questions. And if they say yes to all those three, then I'll actually show them my calendar and I'll let them book a time with me to do a demo call. But if they say no to either one of them, they'll just get a generic form. They'll give me their contact information. So, so I'm already thinking and pre-qualifying that traffic that comes my way to specific qualified leads and self-qualifying I'm making sure that they're self-qualifying as they're coming to my site. Um, so it's important to think that way because a lot of times you're going to get a bunch of people come in, everybody's going to fill out the contact form or whatever. And then you're never going to know like who are the best leads? What do I do with them? And your best leads get kind of lost in all the noise. It'll take you a while to respond to somebody to, to most of these people. So I would, Kind of make sure you're you're doing that. Um, just making sure you're self qual, making sure people are self qualifying uh, when they're coming in, and then you can analyze and see. Maybe you can push more traffic to that page to that article later on if it's actually bringing in good leads. So we have a customer and a good good friend of mine, Yesware. Yesware is a company that allows you, you know, to. Um, uh, do a bunch of like cold emailing and stuff and, and check your emails to see if they've been opened and, and all that stuff. And so, um, when in the early days they were covered by Forbes, 
they got a bunch of leads and they actually converted these leads pretty much right away, right? Sometimes your product doesn't need a physical demo. Uh, so you can literally just point them to a pricing page and say, convert, convert, convert. Um, they got a bunch of people who converted off that one article. It was just really well positioned article. So they actually ran ads to that article. Um, they ran it through uh, Google's uh, display network. They ran it on Facebook. Uh, and the more ads they ran to that article, the more leads they got out of it. And eventually they ran so much ads that it became one of the best articles of the year in terms of number of likes and number of sort of comments on it because they ran so much ads on it. Uh, so Fe uh, Forbes actually featured it as top 10 articles uh, and they got even more press on it. But I always think that way. It's like the traffic coming in, how can I convert it the best? Will I be pushing traffic towards it later on? That kind of stuff. So yeah, you're thinking about the entire, the entire funnel. Uh, how do you do PR for just reach out? I mean, the entire point of your business is you're helping all of these indie hackers and smaller companies get affordable PR, which I think is a brilliant business model, really, because anything where you're helping other companies make more money, uh, people are going to pay you for. How do you get attention? You know, you're on this podcast. Is this your primary way of getting people to sign up for your product? What's your PR strategy like? So, um, like I was mentioning, so I rank for all the major, like how to write a press release. I'm number one media pitch. I'm number one PR outreach. I'm number one email pitch. I'm number one. And so like different types of keywords that, um, are relevant to my audience, I try and rank for on Google. And the way I do that is by podcasts and guest posting and my blog. So I write up an article about PR outreach. I make sure that it's the best thing that I can bake up on my own here, right? And so um, then I go and I do a bunch of podcast appearances. I'll go and uh, contribute articles to different publications. Um, you know, entrepreneur Forbes, um, and I, I've written over 1500 articles over the last 11 wow. years. Um, I've cataloged all of them on criminally prolific, my blog. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's just, you know, you try to make sure that you're referencing your own writing and your guest articles, if it makes sense. Um, so I would put a lot of examples and templates, uh, into my articles on my own site on just reach out blog. And then whenever I write about it, whenever I talk about it, I bring up these examples and people link to them from different blogs and podcast notes. And then, uh, eventually they start ranking and they start ranking for very specific terms in my industry such as like how to do PR outreach, how to write a press release. And then once I rank for them, then I start pulling in traffic. And so um, something that I didn't mention on your other question is when people read your articles, they're not necessarily ready to convert. They're kind of like interested in something before they buy something from you. They need to know you better. And so I have a lead magnet, which most people kind of understand. It's like a little PDF of something that they can use. And it's pitch templates, how to pitch journalists. Whoever comes to my blog gets a little uh, sort of teaser saying, hey, do you want the pitch templates? When they get and they sign up through the pitch templates, only then do I say, hey, you're going to get the pitch templates in a few minutes. I suggest you check out template number three in there. But if you want to kick it up a notch, if you really want to start doing PR outreach on a different level, um, sign up for a demo and our tool helps you kind of streamline the whole process. So that's where I try and see if they can self-qualify to a sale. So they might say, all right, well, um, I'm, I'm all for these pitch templates, but I don't want a demo. Like I don't have money for it. Or they start filling it out and they tell me that they've never been impressed. They don't have a content marketer. You know, I, I'm probably going to say, listen, you're not the best fit, but do use the pitch templates, do it on your own. Uh, so I try and make sure uh, like there's a whole conversion mechanism there in terms of people finding me on Google and converting through. Uh, but I don't do any big splashes. I'm never in TechCrunch. I'm not in uh, featured guests in, in, on any big talk shows. I don't go on, you know, I've been on Mixergy podcast, but that's like my um, client kind of like, but I, I've been on Entrepreneur on Fires is a big podcast, but I, I try to avoid the big splash homepage splash. A lot of our clients have been, I just, 
don't think it's useful for me. I want to rank for those keywords. I just published an article on SaaS PR. So my, my goal for the next three months to try to rank number one for the term SaaS PR. And so now I'm going to be doing outreach and I'm going to do mainly not really outreach, but just literally doing a lot of interviews and doing a lot of guest writing to, to link to that piece, to promote it. Uh, so that that ranks number one on Google. That's mainly how I do it. That's these articles rank on Google. They come in and uh, people come in as leads from them. And that's all. <laughs> what if I wanted to do uh, PR for indie hackers? For example, I've got the podcast. There's so many cool episodes like this one where, you know, I want as many people to listen to it as possible. Uh, how would you approach something like that? You know, would I try to get the press to write about individual episodes and the story shared there or the podcast as a whole, or is PR even a good way to promote a podcast? So I wouldn't get journalists to write about it. I would actually try and do guest writing yourself about it. So I would go out to blogs, marketing blogs, or it could be even company blogs. Like there's tons of companies out there looking for good content that are in the communication space or even cold email space, sales blogs, whatever. And I would write guest articles that link back to your episode. So make your episode uh, the best thing they can be. So under, say, our interview, put together like a crazy resource list and an infographic of a process of how to do PR, kind of like break down what we just talked about. A, get some uh, keyword research, figure out which keywords I want to rank for. B, figure out, write the article on my blog. C, do some guest posting and podcast to promote the article on my blog. D, get my article to rank high. Kind of like break that down into sort of a little step-by-step. Uh, -step. Have our interview on there. Have all the resources on there. Now it becomes sort of a magnet for people to check out, learn something from, and reference. Now you're ready to go and write about it. So now you can go out to... I don't know, maybe you go out to startup.com or startups.com or you go to like uh, some other marketing blog, marketingprofs.com and you go and you say, listen, I have a great article about how to do PR on a shoestring based on this interview uh, and you write it and then you reference your interview on your site. So you say, well, Dimitri talked about this one tactic uh, at 20 minutes on the, uh, on our interview, I broke that down in my article. And so now uh, this article is on, on your site. You're writing a guest article. You're really linking to the original piece where you, we have the interview. We have this posted. And you're doing that over and over and over again so that, um, you know, you're, you're getting these links inbound to that piece of that piece of content on your site. And you're not going after too many. Like we have a case study pipe drive did, uh, with us. Um, you know, we did six articles or five articles um, on other sites, blog posts, and um, they rank number one for the term sales management, which is a huge term. It's got hundreds of thousands of uh, searches a month. Um, so you don't need too many inbound links. You just want them to be high quality, um, you know, but that's, so how, that's how I do it. Most founders listening to this podcast are, I would say, in the pretty early stages. They don't have... A ton of time you know maybe they're working on the side of their full-time job uh and i think a lot of people just lack confidence that certain things are going to work so they just want to kind of dip their toe in the water they're not really sure uh if they want to go you know for the full checklist of all the things that you're sent you're kind of laying out here because it's a lot of work uh if you're just trying to get started with pr you know what are some of the smallest things that you can do to see if this you know is even the right channel for you to get a little bit you know, of success, a few wins under your belt before you dive into the full SEO, write articles, put together infographics and surveys and pitch everybody. So I would literally, I would go like, for me, I'd go on press opportunities filter here and just type in entrepreneur, which I just did. And it's like five things you need to know to succeed uh, in remote work life, right? Um, I need this by uh, Forbes reporter needs it by 2nd of August. So I go and, and I, and, and so as a person that doesn't have just reach out, I'd go to helpareporterout.com or I'd go to Twitter and type in hashtag journal request. Journal is in journalist, journal request or hashtag PR request and literally look for something that's in my space. I'm an indie hacker. I'm an entrepreneur. Type in entrepreneur hashtag journal request 
in Twitter. You'll see all these people popping up saying, hey, I want to, you know, chat with an entrepreneur. I'm a so-so reporter. Some of them might be Forbes. Some of them might be a no blog, no name blog that you don't know. But respond to them. Get them to feature you, correspond with you. And then see if you can get any kind of traffic out of it or any kind of uh, business activity out of it. Um, and start dipping your toes in the water that way. That takes you 20 minutes a day, maybe three times a week. That's not a huge commitment. You have that time. Uh, and it's nothing that's going to change your work life, right? It's not it's 20 minutes a day, three times a week is going to be fine. And you'll get to see, you'll get to live the process a little bit. It's going to be cheap. You're not going to spend any money on it. And you're going to start dipping your toes in the water. Then say you get one hit and you get featured somewhere or you get quoted somewhere. You don't get too many people coming your way. We're like, well, heck, maybe that blog wasn't the right fit in terms of my mm -hmm. audience, but it was cool that I got on there. Maybe I need to dial into who I got to go after now. So now you're going to go after only an entrepreneurship blog or, or whatever where your audience hangs out. But you're going to use that as ammo now. Now when you reach out, you're going to say, hey, I was on this, this blog already. I was just, just there. Are you at all interested in you know, having me on? Very cool. Well, listen, Dimitri, you are uh, obviously a PR expert. And I've learned a lot just in this episode. Uh, but you're also an indie hacker yourself. You have a very successful business. Uh, we spoke earlier this year on an earlier episode that I suggest people go and listen to because... You've got just such a cool working style. You're working five hours a day. After that, you pull the plug and you're just like back to your normal life. Uh, you're profitable, you're bootstrapped. What's your, your general advice for an indie hacker who's just starting out? What do you think they should know? What do you think they should avoid uh, and take away from sort of the lessons that you've learned? Um, I'd say avoid this mentality of um, we need insane growth to prove who we are to the world and do what you're passionate about and stop chasing numbers and other successes that other people have in your industry or generally in life. Um, worry about you and what you can do. And that's not to say that you shouldn't have goals or aspirations. It's just uh, stop basing what you wanna do uh, on others, uh, other stories or other successes that people have had. Uh, don't Google s success tips and, and, and try and learn from people who have made it in their life because chances are they're not telling, I know this for a fact, they're not telling you the whole truth. The most successful, most wealthy person in the world, I'm sure like their relationship with their loved ones and their family is not the same as uh, as as you with with not as much money, right? Um, so there's a lot more to learn to that success. What did they have to kill off to get to that success? That person with 700 people who work for them that makes multi million dollar business in the same niche that you were in, and you're killing yourself saying, "Well, I can't even get a hundred customers." It's like, uh, you know. Um, Put it all in perspective and see like where you want to be. Um, that's mainly what I say is like live, like do what you're passionate about. Don't forget your family, your loved ones, your friends. And don't forget that it's like you just get this life, you know, and you only get this time once. Like spend your time as if like it was. Uh, time like most of us don't live that way I feel like I, I interviewed Patrick Byrne from um, uh, um, overstock.com he's the CEO and so he was diagnosed with this rare disease and I told him like he was gonna die in the next 12 months and then they something happened they, they were able to cure and they said well we can extend it for another 12 months and so when he was younger, he learned to de to live his life in that way. Like, yeah, I only have 12 months to live. I got only 12 months to live. And so he now lives that way, right? So he, he, this thing is kind of, they, they figured it out. They, he, he didn't die and he, he's, he's alive and well. But that mentality stuck with him. It's like, if I was going to die in 12 months, like, what would I be doing? You know, like, what would what would you be doing? Like you're listening to this interview, 
you're doing what you're doing working but like how would you change your life you know and try to live that way right um don't chase other people's dreams don't chase some growth numbers because somebody said that you should have them um, don't raise money because you think you need to scale because you're not making enough of an imprint on the world just 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 do what you're passionate about help people out the best you can and just do the best job you can you know live life to the fullest i'd say because you won't get this time back <laughs> beautifully stated i love i love all of that and you know so much of what you see on the internet and and articles it's all it's all kind of like a facade you know it's like instagram people are going to put their best foot forward they're going to show you all the glamorous best parts of their lives and their stories. And that doesn't mean that it's fake. Like the good stuff really is good, but no one's gonna, they're not gonna tell you the work, like all the sacrifices they had to make to get there. They're not gonna tell you about the hard parts. They're not gonna be, you know, putting up profiles of the way that their business ruined their family, uh, as you mentioned. You know, I'm reading yeah. a biography on Warren Buffett. And I love biographies because they're so long and they're in depth and you really do get to see kind of both sides. You don't just only see like the sort of glitzy magazine profile of the things that went well. And it's like that guy, obviously very successful, but he was so obsessed with his work, like his wife just left him. She just like left and moved away and he was totally blindsided by it. And he didn't have a relationship with his kids. And he like to this day has a lot of regrets about just how myopic he was about that success. So That's I think you're totally a right. big theme, man. That's yeah. There's a it's Clayton consistent. Christensen. Clayton Christensen wrote the book called Innovator's Dilemma. He wrote another book called How Will You Measure Your Life? Yeah. Clayton Christians was was in Harvard and all of his class like in the 70s or 80s whenever like he was graduating from there they made it to like the biggest like heads of McKinsey consulting and Bain and company and some of the biggest Ernst and Young some of the biggest firms in in our lifetime these people were like heads or you know very high up in these firms their most successful people out of him like he was you know he's a somewhat successful author and he went and go went to talk to them like what's their like personal life with uh, what are they doing and so uh most of them are on their fourth wife they haven't talked to most of their kids um in in, in like years their kids don't yeah. talk to them they have insane amounts of wealth but their their like relationships their personal relationships are spent they're done and it's like and they're workaholics they're going crazy with with the like working 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 i was like when like I read a lot of that stuff and I knew I was fortunate to follow like 37 signals and those guys early on. Cause I was like, they guided me to this, like, you know, uh, thinking and lifestyle where it's like family first, man. And like your, your personal life first, your personal kind of inspira aspirations and all that. Yeah. It's interesting because even those stories, which seem pretty horrible, aren't even the worst. The worst stories are the ones that nobody writes about where somebody spent all their time being a workaholic, trying super hard to, you know, build something huge. And then they didn't succeed and they still sacrificed all of their happiness and their personal time and their relationships. And I think the whole point of being an indie hacker is realizing that you don't have to do that. Like you can build a really great life for yourself. You could be making millions of dollars a year and be super happy and only be working, you know, 30 hours a week. It's totally possible. I've spoken to lots of people who've done it. So, uh, Dimitri, appreciate the reminder and appreciate you coming on the show as usual. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks for having me and uh, happy to help anybody out there. <laughs> uh, will you let us all know where we, can, where we can find you, where we can find some of the resources you talked about, maybe get in touch? Yeah, check out, just reach out. Um, so, and uh, criminallyprolific.com is my blog. Um, Grammarlyprolific.com is my main blog where I just kind of personally share everything that I talk about and just reach out is the, the tool that I run. So, All right. Thanks again, Dimitri. All right. Thank you.